Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. The subject for this week's program is the false religion of wokeism. And we might as well call this whole movement of being woke an ism because it's a religion like Buddhism or Hinduism or Universalism or Marxism or Paganism or Humanism. And now there is wokeism. It has a God which is man's feelings. Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, their God is their appetites. It has a Bible, critical race theory and gender theory, just like Marxism had Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto. It has a soteriology, the, a doctrine of salvation, that man is saved by throwing off uh, biblical revelation and Judeo-Christian Western values. It has an eschatology, a doctrine of last things, that man will be free and happy once all morality and accountability and responsibility that makes us feel bad about ourselves is finally eliminated uh, by the power of a socialist state. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 19, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. It has an offering out of the $2 trillion 2021 American Rescue Plan. Millions are going to pay for the salaries and the programs of leftist social action groups. Plus there are millions in corporate and private donations to BLM and their fundraising platform, Act Blue. Wokeism has its meetings. Many of these leftist organizations meet three times a week. For these woke social justice warriors, political action is their church. Their goal is not to save souls for God, but to win by taking over the power of government. And in this religion of wokeism, there are the evangelists and the evangelistic meetings, protests, rallies, key speakers and writers. Wokeism is a religion. And the title being used being woke is not random. It means to be enlightened, to see the light, that they have been awoken to the injustices and the oppressions in society centered in racism. So what do they know that we don't know? Well, they have learned to see the world through the eyes of critical race theory, that everything is about the powerful trying to oppress the weak, just like in Marxism, but this is social Marxism. For them, oppression is what morality is secretly all about. And that's what capitalism is all about. That's what America is all about, oppression. And if you think men are still men and women are still women, it's because you haven't been awoken to the fact that gender is a made-up social construct. This stuff needs to be learned through false teaching because it doesn't fit in with God's natural order and the natural conscience that God has given to man. As in this article in Touchstone Magazine, Why Liberals Are Smarter, or Why Do They Claim to Be Smarter, quote, the liberal has reason to believe himself intellectually superior to the conservative, reason to sneer, and to strut if he feels so inclined, because he, in fact, does know. To be what he is, he must know more than the plain man, the natural conservative. He has learned something that the conservative has not. He has been ideologically indoctrinated. Good point. But to be biblical, the answer is that the liberal actually knows less. God's morality is a deeper wisdom, but what the left has learned is new justifications for his rebellion against God. He no longer has to play the part of being the Christian. So this is modern wokeism. In the first three centuries of the church, the era that the church was up against called itself Gnosticism. That's the Greek word for knowledge. These people were calling themselves the knowing ones. Because they believed they had certain esoteric knowledge derived from philosophical pagan thought 
that put them above other people. Their special insight was the source of their meaning, their purpose. It was their religion. And the early church had to expose this and to refute it. And there are a number of apologetics written by the early church fathers against Gnosticism. This is the kind of false religion that the New Testament talks about. Acts chapter 20, verse 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse or twisted things to draw away disciples after them. 2 Peter chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. Jude 12, these men are hidden reefs in your love feast. And this is what Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 1. You are deserting Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. The gospel literally means good news. And Paul is implying here that these false teachers will present their teachings as an alternative good news, a way of having a better life or a better society. But they're frauds. If God calls his truth good news, you can be sure that Satan's going to come along and claim that his message is good news. And these supporters will promote it as being good news. It will be their religion, their crusade, their source of self-worth and righteousness. But it's a lie. And the people of God, the church, need to expose it and refute it. The early New Testament church refuted Gnosticism, and in every generation, there has been some variant form of Gnosticism that the church has had to fight. In the Middle Ages, the church had to fight Romanism, the wedding of tradition and paganism with Christianity. In the 1700s, uh, the American theologian Jonathan Edwards had to combat the ideals of the Enlightenment. While Edwards was here in America uh, teaching the true gospel, there was the atheist David Hume and Thomas Hobbes in Europe creating the secular enlightenment. The two movements were happening at the same time, the biblical reformation versus the enlightenment. The one was turning to the Bible for truth. Uh, the other was tur turning to human reason and desire for truth. The one promised liberty by returning to the word of God. Uh, the other promised liberty by breaking away from religion. But it's interesting to note that the revival in America was called the Great Awakening. The unbelief in Europe was called the Enlightenment. And today, the social Marxists and LGBTQ are calling themselves being woke. Notice it's all claiming light. But be careful. There is the true light. John chapter 1, verse 9. There is the true light, which comes into the world, enlightening every man, Jesus Christ. But there's also the false light, the imposter light, which is darkness claiming to be light. 2 Corinthians 11.14 No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So beware of wokeness and wokeism. It is not the great awakening of God's truth. It's an awakening to the arguments and the reasonings of Satan. And the unsaved mind, when he hears this, he likes it. Now he has a reason and a religion for his bitterness, his jealousy, and his lust. So let me pause here and formally define wokeism. There are so many components. It could take me a number of programs to explain all of the nuances. But the bottom line, as I just explained, it's all based in oppression. That God is the oppressor, he oppresses us through his moral and economic laws, through his accountability, through his requirement of our responsibility. But of course they will not say that God is the oppressor. 
but that the European God and his values, the God of the Jewish people, he is a made-up God to oppress others. Western religion was made up for the purpose of oppression. That is their great awakening. It's not just about being awakened to racism. It's being awakened to believe the lie that certain European white people were secretly trying to oppress other groups with made-up religion and religious values, being called now white values. Now, there is an LGBTQ element to all of this, which seeks to use this philosophy to throw off all social sexual morals. There is an economic element, which calls property rights and capitalism oppression in order to bring in a communist state. The goal there is not to have to work by the sweat of one's brow, uh, but to live off of the producers. And there is a racial element to this, where certain groups are trying to get political power and moral authority by claiming that they are continually victimized. But the racial component is being used by the homosexual woke and the Marxist woke to indict America's moral and economic law, to indict America's history, and to get some moral authority for their cause. They will claim that Christianity produced slavery, and so you see Christianity is all wrong because it's about oppression. So if you want to turn America into a communist version of Sodom, you have to find some way to discredit America's Judeo-Christian philosophy of government, law, economics. Well, that's where wokeism and critical race theory and the 1619 Project step in. Now, in this religion of wokeism, there are many sub-doctrines. Such as, while the Bible says, judge not, wokeism says, judge. While the Bible says, do not repay evil for evil, wokeism teaches, repay evil for evil. While the Bible says, forgive, wokeism says, demand revenge. While the Bible says, I'm a sinner, wokeism says, it's someone else's fault. What we have in wokeism is really nothing more than old-fashioned idolatry. Every text in the Old Testament that refers to idolatry refers to modern-day wokeism. People tend to think of idolatry as some obsolete relic of the past, but idolatry is alive and well. It's man's desire to make for himself a God that agrees with his own sinful beliefs and practices. It's too much to explain away God and spirituality. So man simply redefines God, sometimes making himself God. Paul describes this in Romans chapter 1 as an exchange. They exchange the truth of God for a lie, and they worship man rather than their creator. Now, today, we may not have the stone statues that are in the shape of deities, but men still worship what the ancients used to worship, the ideology behind the statue. When the ancients were worshiping Baal, it wasn't really about the statue. That was just the outward symbol. What they were really worshiping was fertility, a bumper crop, prosperity. It was the ancient form of the prosperity gospel. Notice the Ten Commandments. What are the two first commandments? You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol. This is not simply about not making images of God on earth because such images would be inadequate. It's about man's propensity to reimagine or rename God with a false religion. No other God means no other character of God or truth of God. The statue represents that new definition of God, that new character of God, that God is a bull or that God is a tall man or that God is a horned creature. But it really wasn't as much about the statue as it was about this new character given to God. Because man is at enmity with God and man's fallen nature is contrary to God's nature, 
man is out to redefine God's character. So if you had to start a country and you were told that you could only have 10 rules, what would they be? You probably would not make the first rule, you shall have no other gods before the true God. But that's the one command that's essential for a nation to survive. If a people create a false god, lies with the subsequent immorality that flows from worshiping a false god, whether that be wokeism or any other ism, that nation will soon destroy itself. The right religion, the right God, the right ideology is crucial. There needs to be truth in a nation, just like there needs to be truth in a family. Because a nation's moral compass must be true. But with the religion of wokeism, that's all overturned. Well, let me now share with you some examples of wokeism, particularly wokeism's recent evangelistic efforts, just so that we understand uh, how this religion of wokeism is spreading across America and across the world. Very similar to the way Christianity spread and grew and could not be stopped in the ancient Roman Empire. There is a prophesied reversal in the world from paganism to Christianity, and then from Christianity back to paganism, and then the coming of Jesus Christ. Well, my first story, President Biden, with all of his new Democrat administration pulling the strings, have the Department of Education sending out grants for schools across America to incorporate the teaching of critical race theory and particularly the New York Times 1619 Project, which frames the history of America as racist. And to incorporate, in K-12, through Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is one of the Bibles of wokeism. You know, people may think that there is no religion in public schools, but there most definitely is. Pagan educators are evangelizing students with their secular authors and religions, just like a Christian school would use the Bible. There's no such thing as neutrality in education. So here are some of the wordings of this new Department of Education ruling. Recipients of such grants must take into account systemic marginalization, biases, inequities, and discriminatory policies and practices in American history. Incorporate racially, ethnically, culturally, and linguistically diverse perspectives and perspectives on the experience of individuals with disabilities. In other words, bring in all sorts of other ideologies and, besides Christianity. Encourage students to critically analyze the diverse perspectives of historical and contemporary media and its impacts. Uh, support the creation of learning environments that validate and reflect the diversity, identities, and experiences of all students and contribute to inclusive, supportive, and identity-safe learning environments. Well, this is all the language of wokeism. Now, the ruling doesn't come out specifically in state that schools must teach critical race theory. I mean, that would be too obvious. What happens is that the Department of Education gives out these general guidelines created by leftist social leaders. Then along comes BLM, and LGBTQ groups to provide the curriculum to meet the standards. I mean, this is what's happened in New Jersey. The state passed a law that LGBTQ history has to be taught in public schools. And then the state homosexual group, Garden State Equality, gets the contracts to supply the curriculum because they're the only group that meets the standard. You know, when the um, state of New Jersey <laughs> mandated that schools teach LGBT history, I told some legislators, great, this is our mandate to teach all of the perversions and, and the devastating co consequences of, of LGBT uh, throughout American history. But no, you know, the implementation is actually controlled by the homosexual lobby. Well, the public has till May 19th to comment about this federal Department of Education ruling 
The Republicans have already voiced their opposition, explain, explaining that this is racial indoctrination. But the ruling will likely be implemented. And grant money will flow from Washington to any school district that wants to hire some woke, diversity, critical race theory coordinator to implement this curriculum, to hire a high priest of wokeism, a wokeism chaplain, just like schools in America used to have Christian chaplains and Christian chapel services. The other news story uh, that has come out lately is that we're seeing some communities objecting to school boards implementing critical race theory curriculum, being snuck in by uh, leftist educators. In South Lake, Texas, the school board introduced the teaching of CRT into the classroom, and a few parents who are well informed on this subject rose up and protested. And in their election last week, the township voted out all of the woke school board and city council people. Let me read a portion of an article describing the situation down there in South Lake. Quote, in an unusually bitter campaign that echoed a growing national divide over how to address issues of race, gender, and sexuality in schools, candidates in the city of South Lake were split between two camps. Those who supported new diversity and inclusion, inclusion training requirements for the students and teachers, and those who, backed by a political action committee, that was formed last year to defeat the plan. On the one side, progressives argued that curriculum and disciplinary changes were needed to make all children feel safe and welcomed. On the other, conservatives in South Lake rejected the school's diversity plan as an effort to indoctrinate students with a far left ideology that according to some would institutionalize discrimination against white children and those with conservative Christian values. In the end, the contest was not close. Candidates backed by the conservative South Lake family PAC won every race 70% to 30%, including those for two school board positions, two city council seats, and the mayor. Well, that's good news. And to note, one of the reasons these parents knew about the evils of CRT is due to the amazing God-sent work of conservative media, the you know outlets like the Daily Wire, PJ Media, Townhall.com, even Fox News, Family Research Center, even my small YouTube plays a part in moving the culture. But the bad news is that even though these conservative parents stood up, the state and the public schools are populated with educators who believe in wokeism. And this leftist way of viewing America is already written into the mainstream public school textbooks. And these Christian activist parents in South Lake were unusual. In most school districts, CRT and LGBTQ curriculum is being implemented under the radar without much parental opposition. Now, I could take an entire program and we could discuss all the arguments back and forth between the two sides in South Lake. The arguments from the left were very alarming and subtle. But like most issues today, we can't even find the time to focus on that one battle because we are being hit at 10,000 different fronts. Well, here's another example of the spreading religion of wokeism. Penn State is making sure the university becomes inclusive. Penn State's faculty senate has approved the proposition that we would remove gender and binary terms from their course and program descriptions according to the university's student operated newspaper. Uh, the proposition recommends changing the terms freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior to first year, second year, third year, fourth year, and beyond, as well as replacing the terms upperclassmen and lowerclassmen with upper division and lower division. According to the proposition, terms like freshmen and upperclassmen carry a strong male-centric binary character to them 
and can be interpreted as both sexist and classist. They go on to say terms like junior and senior are parallel to Western male father-son naming conventions. The proposition states that the university has grown out of the typical male-centered world. And this is the tenets of wokeism. The overthrowing of gender and gender distinctions and gender roles. While if this was about the spread of Christianity, the article would read that Penn State approves a proposition supporting gender and complementarianism and male headship in the home. By the way, Google Docs will now autocorrect to be more inclusive. Mailman will automatically be changed to mail carrier, chairman to chairperson. The use of mail in our language to describe the entire human race is that way because that's the way the Bible speaks. And that Christian ideal worked its way into our language. But now people are wanting to overturn that. Another example. Did you see the new recruitment ad from the CIA? I could describe it to you, but let's watch it. When I was 17, I quoted Zora Neale Hurston's How It Feels to Be Colored Me in my college application essay. The line that spoke to me stated simply, I am not tragically colored. There is no sorrow damned up in my soul nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. At 17, I had no idea what life would bring, but Sora's sentiment articulated so beautifully how I felt as a daughter of immigrants then and now. Nothing about me was or is tragic. I am perfectly made. I can wax eloquent on complex legal issues in English while also belting Guayaquil de mis amores in Spanish. I can change a diaper with one hand and console a crying toddler with the other. I am a woman of color. I am a mom. I am a cisgender millennial who's been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. I am intersectional, but my existence is not a box checking exercise. I am a walking declaration, a woman whose inflection does not rise at the end of her sentences, suggesting that a question has been asked. I did not sneak into CIA. My employment was not and is not the result of a fluke or slip through the cracks. I earned my way in, and I earned my way up the ranks of this organization. I am educated, qualified, and competent, and sometimes I struggle. I struggle feeling like I could do more, be more to my two sons, and I struggle leaving the office when I feel there's so much more to do. I used to struggle with imposter syndrome, but at 36, I refuse to internalize misguided patriarchal ideas of what a woman can or should be. I am tired of feeling like I'm supposed to apologize for the space I occupy rather than intoxicate people with my effort, my brilliance. I am proud of me, full stop. So this CIA worker begins by explaining where she gets her philosophy. Not from the word of God, not from Christianity, but from Zora Hurston, how it feels to be the colored me. It's all about the humanistic philosophy of look at me, I'm so great. I'm cisgender, I'm intersectional. I'm a millennial diagnosed with anxiety disorder. I'm a woman of color. I used to struggle with imposter syndrome, but at age 36, I refuse to internalize misguided patriarchal ideals. What a woman can or cannot be. I'm tired of being told I need to apologize. It's all about her wokeism religion. The army also came out with a recruitment cartoon and the cadet explains her credentials, how she was an overcomer by having lesbian parents. In wokeism, lesbianism needs to be normalized. Here's that clip. This is the story of a soldier who operates your nation's Patriot Missile Defense Systems. It begins in California with a little girl raised by two moms. So 
So those are just two quick example out of thousands to show how pervasive and entrenched the religion of wokeism has become in America, so much so that it has made its way into ads for the military. Now, this has probably come about through recent hired uh, college graduates uh, who are woke. They're hired into the human resource departments, into the marketing departments, or this could be coming down uh, from new positions in the military required by leftists. You now have to have diversity, inclusion, coordinators. But the sad thing is that these ads will work for many millennials in this generation. Because this is what millennials have been taught in their public schools and universities. All of these buzzwords about self and authenticity and intersectionality and anti-male patriarchy, this is the religion and the morality these students are being taught. Just like students used to be taught the Christian religion in the Bible. This is what we get without God. Paganism fills the void. Call it humanism, call it leftism, call it wokeism. It's all the same thing. In conclusion, of all of the dogmas of wokeism that I could cover, I just want to cover this one. The making of false distinctions, which is often called identity politics. I was covering this Sunday morning in a series I'm doing on the Gospel of Matthew. One of the points that stands out in the Gospels and really throughout the entire Bible is that God divides the human race into two significant groups, the saved and the lost. That's the only distinction that really matters. It's this distinction made throughout the Bible. I hope you didn't miss it. Cain versus Abel, Isaac versus Ishmael, Jacob versus Esau, the righteous kings versus the unrighteous kings, the godly versus the ungodly, the sheep versus the goats, the saints versus the sinners, the sons of light versus the sons of darkness. And again, this is the only truly important distinction in the human race. And it's false teachers who work to make and emphasize wrong distinctions. Now, it's not that these distinctions don't exist, but they are not distinctions that matter when it comes to the important moral issues. Lesser distinctions, such as economic class, ethnicity, education, social status, are not what's important. As Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. False teachers will come along and say, economic class is what a man's life consists in. The unsaved, in their sin and their spiritual blindness, see only these superficial distinctions. And they work to create these false distinctions. And they will blame these superficial distinctions as being the root of all social problems. Like Karl Marx. The problem with the world was the bourgeois versus the proletariat. The owners versus the workers. For the feminists, it's it's male versus female. That's the big distinction causing all the problems. Or it's the old versus the young, or the slave versus the freeman, or the Jew versus the Gentile, or the white versus the Asian, or the black versus the white, or the Irish versus the English, or the Tutu versus the Hottentot. The doctrine of wokeism is founded on making all of these false distinctions. As Jesus said, they neglect the weightier matters of the law, the weightier reasons for social problems. The Bible teaches that there is only one significant difference between men. You're either saved or you're unsaved. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. You're either alive in Christ or you're spiritually dead. You either have the Holy Spirit or you're void of the Holy Spirit. And in the first century, the New Testament apostles dealt with this issue. People making erroneous distinctions between men Distinctions which in the grand scheme of things make little difference and have nothing to do with the real problem. Why are people fighting over ethnicity and culture and language when people are on their way to a Christless eternity in hell? So in the New Testament, there are many verses that say, stop looking at these lesser distinctions and look at men's relationship with Christ. You may have missed the fact that the apostles addressed this problem. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we no longer see him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away, behold, new things have come. After speaking about the saving work of Christ on the cross, Paul makes a remark that most readers of the Bible do not understand. Paul says, I do not recognize anyone according to the flesh, not even Christ. You see, Paul is teaching that the work of Christ on the cross changed the way he viewed people. At one time, Paul evaluated people based on superficial, visual, fleshly considerations. In the historic context, Paul is probably referring to whether someone was a Jew or a Gentile, a Roman or a non-Roman, a rich man or a poor man. These are the distinctions people make when they size up other people. But now that Paul is living for Christ, he says he evaluates people different. Paul even points out that he doesn't even evaluate Christ in the same way, the way he used to evaluate him. Maybe Paul used to view Christ in a demeaning way as a false teacher or as some backward rabbi from Galilee who wasn't trained by the professionals in Jerusalem. But in verse 17, Paul states the distinction that matters. Whether or not someone is in Christ, saved or born again, because if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. In other words, that's the distinction that's significant. Now, Christians often quote 2 Corinthians 5.17 to point out the change that takes place when one is saved. And that's true. But often we don't see the context and we miss the, the, the other truth contained here. The point that Paul is making is that what matters is not fleshly distinctions between people, but whether someone is or is not in Christ. You know, the SJW sees all of the problems in the world as black versus white. When the problem is that men are unsaved and that men are evil and that men need to be born again. Paul explains this again in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, uh, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. The renewal Paul is referring to is not a renewal of his magazine subscription, but the new birth, conversion. Because of the reality of conversion, those other distinctions people make are irrelevant. And then Paul emphasizes the priority must be on people's status in Christ. Christ must be all in all. Also, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor freeman. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Again, in Paul's day, the big fight was over social divisions between Jews versus Gentiles, Romans versus non-Romans, uh, economic classes, uh, the owners and the workers. And Paul has to explain to the Galatians that those social distinctions don't matter. What matters is whether you belong to Christ or not. Not which, which social group you belong to. Your identity is not the color of your skin. Now, in wokeism, your identity is the color of your skin. If you belong to whiteness or blackness, then you are heirs according to the promise. But that's not the scriptural message. Also, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. In other words, being a Jew or a Gentile is meaningless. Galatians 6, 5, For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 19, Circumcision is nothing. 
And uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Again, the religion of wokeism teaches the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Every problem, every solution is about race, uh, the color of people's skin, their sexual identity, their economic status. And not only is that an error, but it avoids and obfuscates the true division in mankind. The moral division between the saved and the unsaved. And these people will be before the judgment seat of Christ. And they will be condemned for spending their lives talking about white versus black when they should have been talking about saved versus unsaved. Being in Christ versus not being in Christ. Two closing points. First, The religion of wokeism and its followers are heading for destruction. Philippians 3.9, their end is destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1.7, everlasting destruction to those who do not obey the true gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 2.1, by spreading destructive heresies, they will bring swift destruction upon themselves. This is the word apollyon. Uh, the root word for the apocalypse, a time of destruction. And it's interesting how often this word is used in regard to judgment upon false teachers. God wants us to know that they will be destroyed. And the second point, which must be included, is that we can have a true awakening, a true wokeness, if people turn to scriptural truth. The truth in the word of God set people in a completely different frame of mind. And the true gospel has something that the woke gospel does not have. The power of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. As in the city of Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, verse 20, So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. And I believe that day is coming soon. Now, God might let the false teachers of wokeism continue for a little while so that these people might first be exposed before they're judged. But wokeism is coming to an end soon. The future will not belong to them. They are not the future. The wicked are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. Thank you for including God and country as one small part of your discipleship in the Word. Share, like, leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe. Seems like I get at least 10 new subscribers every week, which is small peanuts compared to big media. But I think it's still a miracle. Well, let Jesus Christ reign. God bless. (laughs) 